It is the voice of Indiana County, WCCS AM 1160 and 101.1 FM. And good morning to you. Glad that you're with us here today. And glad to talk this morning with Christina Grossinger, who is the director for the Center for Pollinator Research at Penn State. And she's pinch hitting for our buddy Bob Pollock today. So we're not going to ask her any questions about lawns and gardens and trees and, and all of that stuff. Christina, I bet you that makes you pretty happy. Uh, yeah, that does make me happy, Todd. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but you are the director for the Center for Pollinator Research, and uh, I want to talk to you about bees. Um, of course, in the last five or ten years, we've heard much about uh, the the really devastating effects on our bees of whatever has caused their numbers to reduce. And, and you're right in the middle of that battle, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, we actually, so at the Center for Pollinator Research, we have uh, the largest group a faculty who are working on issues related to bees and other pollinators in the world. That's a good place to start because I think people might not understand what a pollinator is and how important they are to our environment and, and really to life. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so uh, bees and other pollinators, are, uh, they're really important basically for moving pollen from you know, the, the mommy parts of the flower to the daddy parts of the flower, essentially. And, uh, and 90% of our flowering plant species benefit from having animals move their pollen around. And that translates into about three quarters of our major food crops that use pollinators. Um, and the main food crops that really need pollinators are our vegetables, our fruits, and our tree nuts like almonds. And so it's basically all of the things that your doctor says you should eat to have a healthy diet. Um, we can thank bees and other pollinators for that. Um, and the Pennsylvania uh, agricultural economy actually is very pollinator dependent. We have one of the most diverse agricultural systems in the United States, and pollinators contribute about two hundred fifty million per year to our to our um, economic value of our agricultural crops. I think people would be surprised to learn uh, just how dependent um, our commercial farmers are to the point that there are actual businesses out there that uh, rent out bees. Yes, exactly. So there are some um, some crops that are so dependent on pollinators and are in areas that there are not a lot of wild pollinators left. And so they um, contract with beekeepers to bring honeybee colonies in to help with pollination services. And that's actually a really um, big part of what goes on with um, almond growing in California. And I think the statistic is something like 60% of the honeybee colonies in the United States get trucked to California in February to help with almond bloom. Wow, that's amazing. So let's talk about bees in Pennsylvania. How many are there? How many different uh, species or varieties of bees are there? So uh, I think most people are familiar with honeybees. And um, Mm -hmm. honeybees are actually, uh, were brought in from Europe when people uh, moved to the United States. And so they were actually not native to Pennsylvania, but they're sort of our most iconic bee and the one that everyone is most familiar with. And they're the ones that are used um, for a lot of these pollination contracts and also where we get our honey from. Mm -hmm. But Pennsylvania has over 450 species of wild bees. And a lot of these go unnoticed by people because some of them are very small. Um, Some are sort of uh, uh, dark black or or dark green in color. Um, And so people don't really, really uh, are not aware that that's what's actually in their garden. And so there's been an effort underway at Penn State that's being led by Professor Margarita lopez Aribi um, to create a, an updated checklist of bees of Pennsylvania to help people be able to recognize these bees in their backyard. So when we hear of entire colonies of bees that are being wiped out, how are pe- bees doing here in Pennsylvania? Are they healthy? Have they been hit as hard as other areas? Um, we're actually, I think, hit harder than most of the U.S. Mm. So, um, so the Bee Informed Partnership, and until recently, until the survey was canceled, um, the USDA, We're doing surveys of um, bees across the United States and looking at their overwintering survival, right? So honeybee colonies um, live through the winter. They actually make this thermoregulating cluster to keep themselves warm um, when it gets really cold outside. And so, um, but that winter period is a time of the greatest losses, right? And so um, recording this at the national level, what seems to be pretty consistent is that beekeepers have about 30% of their colonies die every winter, which is a a huge number. Mm -hmm. Um, In Pennsylvania, based on survey results from the Pennsylvania State Beekeeper Association, beekeepers are are typically losing around half of their colonies every winter. 
So if you think about this, like if you had a, a herd of cows or you know, chickens or something and you lost half of your animals, you know, that is just a, a tremendous economic blow for our beekeepers. Yeah. Um, in terms of our wild bees, they're harder to track because there isn't, you know, a caring beekeeper <laughs> like mm-hmm. recording what's going on with them. But we have had a couple of um, species, like there's a bumblebee whose name is Bombus pennsylvanicus, right? So pennsylvanicus, you would think that it would be widespread in Pennsylvania, and yeah. it used to be, but now we can barely find it. Um, mm-hmm. And also the, uh, the rusty patch bumblebee was also very widespread, and now it's on the endangered list. And, and of course, that's where you come in, the uh, Center for Pollinator Research at uh, Penn State. Uh, what have you found out about um, what causes uh, the losses and, and why Pennsylvania has been hit so hard? So, um, so there's many factors, and unfortunately, that's sort of the frustrating things with this, this issue is that there's not a single factor that you can say that's what's causing it. It's a whole um, host of things that are acting together. So for honeybees, uh, there's a, a parasite called varroa mites, and um, beekeepers really need to manage those mites as the bees are going into the winter, um, or else, you know, that is the biggest contributor to losses. Um, but then if you manage your varroa mites, you still have losses, and then, of course, the wild bees don't have varroa, and we're still seeing these losses um, for, for their populations. And the main factors seem to be changes in the land use patterns, right? So, um having more land in agriculture or in urban areas. And so that takes away the flowers that the bees depend on for their food. Mm -hmm. Um, For wild bees, they nest in the ground or they're nesting in stems. Um, They're sort of old trees. And so if that habitat is is gone, then they have nowhere to live, right? And then there's also issues with pesticide and uh, herbicide use. So the pesticides, of course, they are used to control our insect pests, but they can also hurt bees if they're exposed to it. And then the herbicides are great at controlling weeds, but the uh, the bees are often using these flowering weeds for their food. Mm-hmm. And then Christina Grossinger, I should tell folks, uh, is pinch hitting for Bob Pollock with us here this morning on Indiana in the Morning. Some of those things that you just mentioned are things that uh, it seems like people ought to be able to help out and, and step yeah. in here. Yeah, and that's actually, I think, one of... Yeah, the really nice things that about working with bees and with other pollinators is there's actually a lot that individual people can do or municipalities can do um, to help bees. And so uh, about two years ago, 28 state agencies and Penn State uh, came together to write the Pennsylvania Pollinator Protection Plan. And that is um, on our website at the Center for Pollinator Research website. And it has basically guidelines for people to create um, better nesting habitat for bees, um, gardens that can support bees through the flowering plants, um, reducing your pesticide use uh, so that you still can manage your pests without hurting the bees, and also guidelines for people who are interested in taking up beekeeping, um, sort of the best practices for that. And and because Pennsylvania is so diverse with its landscapes, we actually have these this information broken down into what you can do in urban and suburban areas, what you can do on roadsides and rights of way, what you can do in agricultural areas, or if you're in a landscape that has sort of more natural lands. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things that um, everyone can do is create a pollinator garden. And actually the Penn State Master Gardeners Program has created a pollinator garden certification program, which has, again, these really just easy-to-follow guidelines for how you can create a pollinator garden in your backyard. And it doesn't have to be very big. It just has to have you know, flowering plants that are attractive to bees and give them nectar and pollen throughout the year. Mm-hmm. And, and tell me about the Beescape program, or is that all a part of it? Um, so the Beescape is a new um, app that we've launched, which uh, you can find on the web uh, if you just go to beescape.org. And basically, with that app, people can find their location, so either um, where they want to keep bees or where their garden is, and they can get information about how what the surrounding landscape is like for bees. So what is the quality of that landscape in terms of how, many, um, how much forage does it have, so how many flowering plants, how much nesting habitat does it have for wild bees, and what is predicted in terms of um, the pesticide use and the pesticide toxicity based on the surrounding crops in your region. And, uh, and we really were excited about Beescape because a lot of this information, it's just really hard for an individual person to, to know, you know, what is going on in the landscape like several kilometers around where I live, right? And mm-hmm. so, um, so this tool gives you a way to 
to get a sense of if you're in an area with um, poor forage, then adding a pollinator habitat or a pollinator garden will be really helpful. If you're in an area that has a lot of pesticide use, then maybe talking to the local um, growers in your area about about the issues can help with that. Um, and then, of course, homeowners can make decisions about what kinds of uh, treatments they're doing in their in their own lawns to to reduce the risk of pesticides. Christina, have we reached a turning point yet in in this whole bee disaster that has occurred in the last five or so years? <laughs> I think so. You know, so so I think there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think we know very well what needs to be done, and people are so excited to help with bees. I mean, this is again one of the the great things about working in this field is that that it's really a grassroots effort, right? So they're, they're um, individual people who then work together with their, you know, with their cities and towns um, and with their local growers to, to sort of change the way that we're dealing with our landscape and making it better for bees. And this was one of the things with writing the Pennsylvania Pollinator Protection Plan was that, you know, everyone who is involved with it, you know, from grower groups to, um, you know, fish and wildlife to uh, urban garden groups, Everyone was just very enthusiastic about the the changes that they could make. So, I feel like in Pennsylvania we are we're in a really good place, and I'm very excited to see how things will will move in the next couple of years. So, hug a bee today, huh? Hug a bee today and plant a flower. <laughs> there you go. That might be a better idea. <laughs> she's Christina Grossinger. Uh, she's the director for the Center for Pollinator Research at Penn State. Pinch hitting today for Bob Pollock. Christina, thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you so much, Todd.